Now the next topic that we are going to go through is that mechanism by which an action potential causes transmitter release from the p-synaptic terminals. Role of calcium ions actually that is going to be highlighted here. Now the basic point here is that there is a hypothesis about calcium ions that how they actually help in the process of p-synaptic neurotransmitter vesicles uh, release. So to describe that I am going to take you back to the previous picture that we actually saw earlier. In this figure we can see that there is presence of calcium ion channels in the p-synaptic neuron terminal. Now in the p-synaptic terminal these calcium channels are going to be elicited by action potential which is actually generated in somewhere actually in of this neuron at the direction of the potential is coming from in this direction and actually this action potential is thought to be responsible in case of stimulating the calcium ion channels. Now what happens is that this calcium ion channel is going to be elicited by the action potential and calcium ions are going to be influxed and they, that means they are going to come inside from the outside. Now how does that help? Now in the p-synaptic terminal there will be a presence of some proteins or these proteins are otherwise known as release sites. Now these release sites have a special binding surfaces for the calcium ions. What will happen is that these calcium channels which are actually opening and the calcium is coming from outside to the inside will be bounded here. Another thing to notify is that um, actually it's not I think highlighted in the guideline but actually that's also a scientific truth that this, neuro, uh, this actually synaptic vesicle or neurotransmitter vesicle also has uh, some protein. Now that calcium that is going to be attached in the release site would actually attract that and that protein is go also going to be attracted here. To the calcium those will fuse and it will cause the formation of this type of vesicles and the vesicles will actually be opened and actually cause the neurotransmitters to come out now actually here it states that that the whole mechanism of the calcium ion contributing in the process of neurotransmitter release is actually a type of hypothesis now this hypothesis is actually very important because it is actually the basis of how the neurotransmitters are released which in turn does a lot of important functions. Now uh, in here we can see the amount that the vesicles actually contain the neurotransmitter acetylcholine between 2000 to 10,000 molecules of acetylcholine are present in each vesicle. That might be one important point to know in case of term viva. Now in the next topic that we are going to know is that action of the transmitter substance on the postsynaptic neuron and the function of those receptor proteins. Now the receptor proteins have some important functions after the neurotransmitter have discharged. These receptors are actually present in the postsynaptic terminal. Now what will they do is that they will actually try to enable the influx or efflux of different ions. These ions in turn will generate the action potential in the next neuron. So before actually all that, let me show you the next diagram which will actually make it easier to understand. Now in this diagram, uh, take this is as a receptor protein. Now this receptor protein and the typical receptor protein has two components. One component is this whole component that is actually situated outside of the cell. This being the bilayer. Now another, the second component is the internal component which is actually protruding all the way through to the internal portion of the cell. Now why is this important? The sole purpose of the receptor ion I said before that is to actually enable the influx or efflux of ions. That is going to be done by mainly two ways. One is the second messenger system. The overall process that this figure shows is the second messenger system. Another process is that it can directly actually get the ions uh, through the bilayer. Now let us actually see that how does it do directly first. Pardon my bad drawing but actually 
uh, it's the best I could do. Now take it as this is the bilayer and this is again a receptor. This is a receptor. Okay. Now this portion would be the receiving portion. Now this type of receptor is actually would be known as a ligand receptor. This would be the receptor portion or the ligand portion. Now the main function of this thing is that this would be the neurotransmitter that will be coming from the presynaptic neuron terminal and it will bind into the receptor site here. Now this type of receptor is actually structurally made so that it can be stimulated by the binding of the neurotransmitter with the binding or ligand site and this directly stimulation will cause the opening of a channel which is actually inside structurally and ions like sodium or some other ions actually would be able to go inside of the channel. Now this function as overall can be stated as the directly getting function of the receptor. Now here we can see that another function that is the second messenger system. Now this second messenger system is actually working like the neurotransmitter substance is again going to the receptor protein site which is actually present in the externally and when it actually does uh, actually does engage in here this will actually elicit the whole receptor protein. Now why is it important is that the elicited receptor protein will actually attract another protein which is actually known as G protein. This whole component is actually G protein. Now G protein we can see has some actually components like alpha, beta, gamma and GDP. Now that those are actually very important. Now this whole second messenger system as a whole uh, actually is more elaborately described in the endocrine portion of the guidon. So I actually think that it would be better to actually watch those clips in our play section then actually discuss the whole second messenger theme here would actually make the lecture more lengthier and it will be actually maybe actually become more boring to the viewers so i am not actually going through all those processes i am in a word actually going to show you that what is happening so no further ado let's jump in now after being uh, actually stimulated this receptor protein in the internally will actually attack this g protein this g protein actually is binding with it now the whole function of the second messenger system is that it will actually uh, do sudden reactions that after those reactions some active sites will be pro that activating site being the alpha unit is actually going to do several functions like this is another specific type of channels uh, present in the cell membrane now what this alpha portion or stimulatory portion would do is that it will actually break up from the G protein and it will then be further attached into the ionic channels here and then cause the ionic channels to be stimulated and to be opened by that it can actually transfer ions inside or outside of the cell so that's the actually the whole uh, functions of the second messenger system now that i am actually sh uh, have showed you the functions of both second messenger system and the directly getting system now what to remember from here is that um, neurotransmitters which actually directly get the ion channels will be having a particular identity or a name that be known as ionotropic receptors whereas uh, those working in the class of second messenger systems breaking the subunits then actually alpha unit doing all the work those will be known as metallo um, sorry metabotropic receptors those will be known as metabotropic receptors now the things about ion channels are very fascinating is that these ion channels are not going to be transmitting uh, same types of ions that we actually can understand it will transmit some various types of ions like sodium ions which are actually cations then there will be passes of potassium ions calcium ions then another type of ion that these are going to pass is that chlorine ions or negatively charged ions. Now, another important thing to know is that 
every channel is not going to be responsible for all these uh, different types of ions or different types of uh, charged ions the specific ion channels which are going to be responsible for the conduction of positively charged ion like sodium ions are going to be known as cation channels now these cation channels are actually cation channels named because they are actually transferring cations but in reality due uh, for the purpose they are actually made in uh, how should i say it in negatively charged because it works in a certain purpose like this think of something like uh, a channel has to pass a specific type of ions now if it has to pass cations then it can be positively charged we know that positively charged uh, stuffs uh, ions actually would uh, not attract positively charged ions they will actually retract them uh, you know what i mean so in order for the big ions to pass they those channels themselves will have to be in negatively charged that is what this uh, phase is saying that those cations are actually negatively charged and that's why those cations in further are going to be transmitted by those roots now in case of those uh, cationic channels those are actually very bigger because sodium ion is itself is very bigger and those anion channels that are going to be responsible for the passage of anions are going to be much smaller than them now we can learn that uh, those channels which are actually transmitting sodium or positive ion in the cell are going to be responsible for generation of action potential in the next so they are going to excite the presynaptic terminal or something so they can be known as excitatory uh, things or stuffs now those two types of ionic channels have a specific type of neurotransmitters like those neurotransmitters which are going to be responsible for the cationic channels to open and the passage of sodium ions those are in turn will be responsible for the illicit of action potentials those neurotransmitters will be known as excitatory neurotransmitter conversely those neurotransmitters which will actually be responsible for the opening of anions and the anions in further will be responsible for the negative charge and those will cause actually uh, for the inhibitory effect those neurotransmitters which will be responsible for all this will be known as inhibitory neurotransmitters i think i have made myself clear but actually uh, the view is actually more simpler than i just described so any man you can actually go through this and you will find the same things that i said now somewhat there is another uh, thing that is very important and that is uh, whenever a neurotransmitter will activate the channel will be opened in a fraction of millisecond but when a neurotransmitter will be no longer present or will be actually absent the gates will be actually equally rapidly closed now this concept will be actually very important in the near future when we visit the certain topics that uh, are up ahead the next important thing that we are going to discuss is that second messenger system in postsynaptic neuron now the second messenger system in postsynaptic neuron now why is this mechanism very very important is that because of the process of memory saving now memory in case of our memory that is the storage of different types of information it takes requirement of prolonged changes in neurons you know that um, we have to memorize something for a longer period of time so that information or stimulation has to actually be present in our brain for a longer period of time and for that storage the neurons should and must be going under some continuous changes now we have learned that when the series of impulses passing in the synapse when the transmitters are actually binding with the receptors they don't actually stay in the receptors for a longer period of time when their function is over when the actually stimulus is passed to the another neuron from presynaptic to prosynaptic of the other neuron those neurotransmitters actually are discharged from the receptors and everything actually goes back to normal now 
if that actually occurs every time then the process of memory those informations would not be stored those stimulations those informations will also be fade away so how does that information or stimulus stay it is due to the fact that second messenger system of this chemical system does some prolonged type of effects in the neuron itself which actually is going to be responsible for those memories or the stimulations to actually stay because the neuron is actually gradually going under those kind of changes it actually states the similar things in the following mechanism here we can see that uh, how it is working the second messenger system first actually does uh, the g protein actually does uh, attach to the internal portion of the receptors then the alpha portion which is the active portion is going to be activated and it ends up doing several functions all this is actually stating those kind of thing that i am actually telling you in short cause this is the vast topic of the endocrine system that actually i'm not going to elaborate it truly i am actually telling it as a whole that how it actually occurs so in q quick view what happens is that when the neurotransmitter substances is actually attaching again the g protein is actually going to be attracted to this inner end and it is going to bind here like this then the active portion being the alpha portion with the gtp portion is going to now act on four types of basical areas we can see that the alpha portion is actually now one directly opening the channels and then it actually does functions with the membrane enzyme and again it can actually active one or more intercellular enzymes and other thing that it can do is gene transcription which is also very very important now in above this portion is actually stating the whole things that i showed into the showed you in the diagram now those four functions are very important that we are going to go through here now one of those four functions being opening of the specific ion channels through the post synaptic cell membrane now why is this important is that due to this g protein effect those ionic channels will actually stay open for a prolonged time in contrast to rapid closure of directly activated ion channels that do not use second messenger systems now it's actually referring to those kind of channels which will which i actually stated previously that don't use this kind of second messenger system and help in the direct pathway of ionic channels i think you realize that what kind of chance that i was talking about the previous channel that i actually drew the diagram it is comparing to that kind of channel with the second messenger system the second point is that activation of actually cyclic adenosine monophosphate now why is this important is that the cyclic monophosphate will actually end up going to a highly specific metabolic machinery which will actually end up are uh, doing long term changes in the structure of the cell and the third point is activation of one or more intercellular enzymes now intercellular enzymes actually will do a specific chemical functions in the cell which will also be very important now the most important thing is in case of the fourth point is that the activation of gene transcription now gene transcription is one of the most important effects of second messenger system now why is that it is due to the metabolic machinery of this structure will actually continue to change because it's actually genetically modifying it and creating actually new proteins so indeed it will be actually very vital point in case of long term of memory process now in the below portion it actually states that when the overall function is done then when it is actually uh, inactivation time of the g protein it's going to reverse itself like g protein actually was gtp plus alpha it will actually convert from gtp to gdp and actually go back to what it and that being that this gtp will actually go back to being gdp and actually alpha will actually unite with beta and gamma and actually go to what it was previously 
now the next easiest thing is that the excitatory and inhibitory uh, receptors in the postsynaptic membrane now what is the importance of having actually two types of receptors is that there are actually presence of two types of channel once one thing is that the cationic channels which are actually important in case of excitatory effect and there are actually another type of channels which are actually anion channels which are actually responsible for that inhibitory effect cause they are actually responsible for the passage of chloride ion from outside to inside and the potassium ion from the outside to from sorry from the inside to the outside now why is all this important because it actually gives another type of dimension this type of characteristic that nervous tissue has its own resistant uh, functions and excitatory functions that kind of variety in the function uh, is due to this fact that it has two types of receptors in excitatory and inhibitory now the process of excitation of the whole nervous cell actually will happen under three things that the one of the things responsible for it is the passage of sodium channels uh, passaging sodium ions which actually are in large proportions and are going to be responsible for the generation of membrane potential in the positive direction which is actually going to excite the cell another thing it going to do is that the depression of conduction of chloride ions and the whole uh, potassium ions it will actually prevent the potassium ions from going outside from the inside now another thing that it can do is stated here is that various changes in the internal metabolism of the postsynaptic neuron to excite cell activity now what does this mean is that there will be various internal metabolic changes in the postsynaptic neuron which will be responsible for the excitatory uh, membrane receptors to increase and decrease the numbers of inhibitory membrane receptors these three, three things as a whole will actually be responsible for the excitation of the whole cell another thing is that inhibition now this will again be responsible for actually three reasons one is opening of chloride ion channels through postsynaptic neural membrane now that will actually help because due for inhibition we actually need more negative ions and this channel is going to permeable for negative chloride ions and chlorides will actually come from the outside to the inside causing more negatively charged ion present in the inside which actually as a whole will be causing the inhibitory effect so another thing is that increase in conductance of potassium ions out of the neuron that will actually also cause more lesser types of positive ions in net present in the whole cell cause the potassium ions are all positively discharged and by this the positively charged ions are actually leaking to the outside and other thing it would do is that activations of receptor enzymes that inhibit cellular metabolic functions that increase the number of inhibitory synaptic receptors now these three points as a whole will actually sum up for inhibitory effect okay right now the part we are going to advance forward is chemical substances that function as synaptic transmitters now there is a table it shows actually four classes um, you can actually go through and these classes are regarding small molecules rapidly acting transmitters now why is the molecular size very important one of the most important point is that the more smaller the molecule is the rapidly the acting capacity of it actually is now the most important point to highlight is that this point which actually states that the neuropeptides in contrast usually use more prolonged actions such as long-term changes in numbers of neural receptors long-term opening or closure of certain ion channels and possibly even long-term changes in numbers of synapses or sizes of synapses now this whole line is actually very important because neurotrans neuropeptides are actually doing the more prolonged actions which are actually important functions in case of our memory as i stated 
before to store a lot of proportion of informations or signals or actually stimulations in our brain there has to be a prolonged type of action uh, persisting in the brain so those things are actually done by the molecules which can perform those functions for a longer period of time such as neuropeptides now as we advance the next topic could be small molecule rapidly acting transmitters now what this phase actually states is that uh, small uh, neurotransmitters those small molecules are going to be synthesized in the post tsynaptic terminals uh, cytosols and they are going to be absorbed by active trans uh, active transport process into many transmitter vesicles in the terminal now that is uh, part of the process that i stated earlier in case of actually synapse how that function works is that those neurotransmitters uh, then actually end up actually stimulating ion channels which actually in many cases are responsible for the ion channels to conduct uh, in case of increasing or decreasing sodium conductance which actually is related to generation of the action potential in the postsynaptic terminal. So the next topic is recycling of the small molecules and above that there is another chart which actually shows neuropeptides slowly acting transmitters of growth factors. If it is important in your institutions, then you can actually go through it. It's actually going to be a lot of related to memory practicing uh, like that. So I'm not actually going through that chart right now. So I'm going through this topic right here, right now. So it states about uh, recycling process that is actually undergoing process of every vesicle that is going to be uh, actually going to be uh, doing the work of transmissions of neurotransmitters now what happens is that it is like a pouch now uh, to understand this let me actually take you back to the uh, picture that we actually went through before so the reason i am actually showing you this picture is to actually make you very clear so this is a synaptic vesicle that we actually learned before and it's actually creating a type of pouch now this vesicle actually is coming here and binding with the calcium ion that is actually binding to another type of protein right here so it's uh, in normal procedure releasing the neurotransmitter now what happens to the vesicle is that it's creating a sort of pouch the next thing that it will do, it will actually align himself completely uh, with the presynaptic terminal and when it's actually done releasing those neurotransmitters, it will actually go again here and become a complete vesicle, not a pouch. So the process of uh, this vesicle actually uh, going to the same as before condition. So this whole over process is type of a recycling process. So here in this line that it states, however, within seconds to minutes, the vesicle portion of the membrane actually envisages back to the presynaptic terminal. Now this actually states how it's being recycled again and again. Now in the later part of the uh, topic, we can see it's actually giving a sort of like example, which in terms here is acetylcholine being the most smallest and typical most smaller molecule uh, in case of transmitting. Uh, it actually obeys the principle of synthesis and really stated which is stated actually earlier now what is this we are going to know it right now here it states that acetylcholine actually uh, is being uh, synthesized in the presynaptic terminal from actually acetylcholine and choline in the presence of enzyme uh, choline acetyl transferase now it's actually very very important in case of viva questions now when it is actually being secreted in the postsynaptic terminal it has to actually pass through the synaptic clip and in the synaptic clip there is a presence of another enzyme what is uh, choline esterase uh, that's actually very important it does actually the function of splitting it again in acetate and choline now this actually helps in terms of passing neuronal signal transmission so it's actually very very important and by this we actually can know that why almighty lord has actually created those spaces known as actually synaptic clips they have also important functions like containing this enzyme right here which actually does the term of separating it now another important term to know is that when it's actually been secreted and it's doing its function once again it will be actually sucked out now the portion that 
first of all acetyl choline is definitely splitting into two things acetate and choline but in terms of recycling process the choline only the choline is going to be actively transported back to the terminal the acetate is not going okay now that's a very important term to notify right now and to memorize also so now the more important topics that we are going to proceed is the characteristic of some important and small molecule transmitters now in this section what is very important to realize is that it states uh, the functions and the secretive sites of different neurotransmitters uh, such as acetylcholine then there is norepinephrine then dopamine that is very very important and has some very pathological importances if anybody considers working in medicine department and then there is glycine GABA glutamate serotonin and even there is nitric oxide the now the most important thing to actually realize from this uh, phase is that actually you would need to know these names to classify the neurotransmitters under some specific headings now that would be very important for in case uh, these headings will actually help you in written cause you have to list the neurotransmitters according to their functions like excitatory inhibitory or both excitatory and inhibitory now uh, let me just give you a quick recap now what are these uh, neurotransmitters under this specific uh, functional class in case of uh, some neurotransmitters which will act only in case of excitatory effect uh, they will be epinephrine and glutamate in case of inhibitory effect uh, contributing neurotransmitters they will be enlisted as GABA serotonin dopamine then there will be alanine glycine etc now in case of the heading both excitatory and inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters uh, we can actually enlist them as acetylcholine and there will be postaglandins, histamines and another thing to most uh, importantly there will be no epinephrine now in this uh, actually phase we can know actually some of them but the rest of the names that I told you a little bit ago these all these names would be very important in case of your written examination now what we can see in this uh, phase is that first of all it describes about acetylcholine and where it secrets uh, there are some points mainly five points nor six points here you have to actually go through and memorize all of this actually nothing to describe more and then there will be epinephrine now epinephrine is actually uh, sorry, norepinephrine is actually uh, secreted in the terminals of many neurons uh, whose cell bodies are actually located in brainstem and hypothalamus. This is actually very important to know. Now, another thing to actually know is that it has also both excitatory and inhibitory effects. Now, these effects actually will actually help you to control overall activity and mood of the mind, such as increasing the level of wakefulness. These are actually very important functions. Another thing to notify is dopamine and where to secrets. It would be also very important as it is actually most of all doing the inhibitory effect and it actually secreted by uh, in the originate of substantia nigra that's also a very important thing to know cause actually dopamine has a lot of pathological values also and actually it is actually very important and that importance is going to be the one of the topics that we will learn in further discussion and after that uh, you would have to know about serotonin as uh, serotonin is secreted in the nuclei that originates in the median raphe of the mid brain stem now why are actually these important is that their basic function and secretion can give you an overview on actually what are the sites they are working on 
Some of these may be secreted in terms of sensory pathways uh, from the presynaptic terminals of sensory pathways. Some actually uh, secreting and working on the total motor area. These are the total variations actually because neurotransmitters are very important in case of uh, synapting capability of transmitting impulses. and. Uh, that's because uh, when we actually memorize them, we can know if certain pathology is occurring into a certain region, we have to give the patient drug to inhibit those neurotransmitters in those certain areas. Those are the actually importance of knowing all these functions and sites. Now, in case of nitric oxide, actually is very, very important cause it actually is suspected that it can help in near future in case of explaining the most behavior and memory patterns of human beings cause actually it is secreted by the nerve terminals in those areas which are responsible for long term behavioral memory changes. Now in terms of actually nitric oxide, what it is important that the mechanism of formation in the presynaptic terminal of it is actually very different than others. It is actually not stored in the vesicles like other neurotransmitters. It is actually synthesized almost instantly as actually it is needed and to the demand it is actually synthesized for over time and then diffuses out of the presynaptic terminals over a period of seconds rather than actually being released in the vesicle packets. Now that is actually very different what is actually makes nitric oxide more different than other neurotransmitters as actually it diffuses to the postsynaptic neuron uh, next and the postsynaptic neurons are actually not directly altering the membrane potential but instead what it does is that changes the intercellular metabolic function that actually modifies the neuronal excitability for seconds that's actually very very important to know now in the topic we are going to go through is neurotrans neuropeptides actually now neuropeptides are actually a lot more different than any other neurotransmitters or any kind of small molecular transmitters because of their method of being synthesized and also the reason for their secretive processes and also in terms of their functions. Now to go through it, let's go to the synthetic topic first. So how they are synthesized is the first question. Now neuropeptides are actually synthesized differently as we actually can speculate. Now they are not synthesized in the cytosols of presynaptic terminals. In terms of synthesis, this synthesis type of process actually acts as an integral part of protein molecules in the ribosomes in the neuronal cell body. So the difference from the smaller actually molecular neurotransmitters uh, and the neuropeptides are that the smaller neurotransmitters would be actually synthesized in cytosols and whereas these neuropeptides are actually synthesized in large protein molecules by the ribosomes so which are present in the neuronal cell body. Now let's come to the secretive process. Now after the protein molecules have actually entered the spaces into the endoplasmic reticulum of the cell body and subsequently in the Golgi apparatus three steps actually occur the first actually is that neurotransmitting performing proteins in the enzymatically splitting into smaller fragments and some of which are either the neuropeptide itself or the precursor of it now the term precursor i believe you all are actually familiar with that what actually precursor means because it's actually not actually functionally capable of doing the functions right now. It has to go through several process to cut off those unnecessary parts of protein where by which actually it can reach to its functional unit. Now in case of the second stage, the second Golgi operators packages the neuropeptides into minute uh, transmitter vesicles that are actually released into cytoplasm and after these two vital changes have occurred then the neurotransmitters vesicles actually will transport all the way to the tips of the nerve endings. Now another important thing to actually notify from in that that actually this traveling process is actually very much slow and occurs only a few centimeters per day. Now, 
when these are actually secreted the secretive process is actually very similar to that of the small neurotransmitting vesicles as they are both triggered by the coming action potentials but the main difference here is after being secreted we know those vesicles would be actually recycled that we previously learned but in terms of neuropeptides no recycling process will actually occur and the vesicle is going to be autolyzed now from the small vas neurotransmitting vesicles they are actually abundantly secreted but this whole process of neuropeptides is actually very laborious process so they are actually secreted in lesser amounts but the whole thing is summed up in terms of neuropeptides as they are actually more potent and the potency is thousand or more times as potent than the neurotransmitters which are actually small molecular so in terms of their characteristics and functions they are actually more advanced than those small molecular neurotransmitters as the functions of neuropeptides are more prolonged in opening calcium channels prolonged changes in metabolic machinery then prolonged changes in activation and deactivation of specific genes and etc these are actually more functional things that neuropeptides do in terms and in comparison to small molecular neurotransmitter which is actually very important to know here now the next topic is about electrical events during neuronal excitation and it has a subdivision in a subheading like resting membrane potential of neuronal soma now the normal resting membrane potential in this figure we can see is minus 65 millivolt that's actually very important to actually memorize right now cause that would be the basis of the further conversation that we are going to have right now now in the graph i'm going to actually discuss everything and i'm going to do that by showing you the graph only cause it would be i think very much easier than to actually go through those lines without actually seeing the figure so in the figure we can see about three ions sodium potassium then there is chloride ion. now in this case we can see those concentrations those ionic concentrations are actually different from the inside of the neural soma and the outside of the neural soma in terms of sodium in, in case of uh, neural soma inside it's actually in less concentration than the outside it is due to the fact that sodium actually attracts a lot of water if any cell in the body is actually having a lot of sodium inside the sodium is going to attract water and the cell will actually swell up and burst that's actually not good in case in terms of potassium it's always in case of any cell it's actually more inside than the outside and then there is chloride ions so chloride ions are actually more outside and lesser inside because they have actually negatively charged and actually end up depressing the whole actually cell so in terms of these ions there are going to be certain pumps which are going to be responsible for this gradient to be checked and certain pumps like potassium sodium pump or sodium potassium pump would be actually responsible to uh, maintain the gradient of sodium more to the outside and less to the inside and in case of potassium more in the inside less to the outside and in terms of chloride there will be also some channels which are going to be responsible for its own ionic gradient uh, difference from the inside to outside now the main key point here is that there is a sort of electric potential across the membrane due to those uh, gradient differences cause we have to actually visualize that the gradient difference is there the potential actually is there because of those gradient differences of ions from the inside and the outside of the cell another key thing that is going to help us understand this matter more uh, elaborately is the Nernst equation that we actually have uh, learned in the previous chapters 4 and 5 in the guide on now what is Nernst potential actually it's a type of uh, potential that exactly opposes movement of an ion so it will be actually directly opposing the movement of an ion through the membrane now Nernst's uh, potential is actually very important and the equation is also very important in terms cause it will actually help us understand the reasons that these ionic potentials are actually present in those milliequivalent per liters uh, 
in uh, several concentrations uh, in the outside or inside of the cell and how these differences is actually going to matter for us now in terms of sodium the difference shown in the figure is that from the outside it is 142 milli equivalent per liter on the exterior and only 14 milli equivalent uh, per liter on the interior so uh, 14 equi milli equivalent per liter is actually much smaller than 142 milli equivalent per liter we actually understand that the reason it's actually uh, in this proportion is that when we actually calculate it and put all those data in the next equation we get plus uh, 61 millivolts so why is that 61 millivolt whereas in the figure we can see the resting membrane potential here is actually minus 65 millivolts so what's happening so mean the main thing that actually matters here is that every time we calculate the nance potential for sodium potassium and chloride it has to reach the certain amount which is minus 65 which is the best resting membrane potential because nance potential is going to calculate the nance uh, potential or you know the main uh, uh, value that is going to be responsible for the stabilization of the whole cell and the, by the word stabilization i mean the certain gradient that will actually remain there and when the gradient is uh, minus 65 in this case or the soma cell so uh, no ion is going to be entering or actually exiting the cell or soma that is actually very important cause that kind of uh, situation is actually being stabilized not being excitatory and not being inhibitory and why is that important no no is that by knowing that mean resting membrane potential and calculating that we can actually theorize the reasons that those ions are actually uh, uh, how they are actually uh, covering those up like in case of sodium that I just mentioned that when we put all those data in the Nernst equation it's uh, positively uh, 61 millivolts however the actual uh, membrane potential is minus uh, 65 millivolts so the sum up and the therefore result would be sodium ions that leak to the interior are immediately pumped back to the exterior so the sodium pump thus maintaining 65 millivolts so look what we have actually done here is that by calculating the nernst equation when we found 61 it actually uh, explains us that sodiums are eager to come inside but uh, due to the fact that the resting membrane potential is minus 65 and it has to be minus 65 it means that each time they actually to come in uh, for the plus uh, 61 millivolts uh, those pumps actually work rapidly and actually maintain the minus 65 by pumping all the sodium outside so by actually calculating the nance equation and actually comparing it to the minus 65 millivolts we can actually determine the function so and what is happening to stabilize the cell by the pumps okay i hope you actually understanding that so in next we are going to learn about so in terms of potassium uh, for potassium ions the concentration gradient is 120 milli equivalent per liter inside the whole neuron and uh, 4.5 milli equivalent per liter outside this concentration gradient would be calculated to be a nance potential of minus 86 millivolts inside the neuron which is actually very much more negative than the minus 65 uh, that actually exists so <clears throat> actually why does that matter that matters because when the um, value is actually decreasing and going to the most minus side it means that uh, the more depression of the whole uh, cell or the soma area is actually becoming so that's actually not good more the negative value goes it actually would be more difficult for that soma or that cell uh, actually in case of in terms of nervous cell to actually get excited and depressed cells actually don't get excited and don't transmit stimulus at all so actually 
they are not functioning correctly so that's the basic interpretation here and the remaining ion is that of chloride ion which is actually in the outside 107 milli equivalent per liter and the inside it's 8 milli equivalent per liter now when we actually calculate the nonce potential uh, what we find is that it is actually about minus 70 whereas the resting membrane potential is actually minus 65 so in terms uh, in case of chloride something also happens uh, to actually maintain it to minus 65 so it's actually very much uh, interesting and important to know because when the action potential will be actually further be generated in the pre-synaptic neurotransmitter after those neurotransmitting vesicles have opened the ion channels this nerve potential will be actually fluctuating and actually resulting in ionic influx and causing more and more deviation from the positive side or to the positive side from the negative side which will actually cause excitation of the whole cell so the next thing we are going to actually go through is that uniform distribution of electrical potential inside the soma now i have used the term electric potential not meaning that not transmission of action potential now why is this important to know is that there is a highly conductive electrical solution in the intercellular fluid of neurons which actually uh, further help in the change if there is any kind of change in potential in any part of the intersomal fluid that actually ends up causing almost equal change uh, in potential for all other parts inside the soma actually the main important key thing is uh, it won't do it as long as neuron is not transmitting at action potential so that's actually very important because it will play a major role in the process of summation of signals entering the neuron for multiple sources that we have previously known that synapses occur in case of uh, from axon to dendrite axon to soma also now uh, in those cases there are actually seen multiple signals coming in a dune in a dendrite in the terminal portion in the later portions so actually those uh, all those signals and those action potentials are uh, uh, how should i say it are uh, summation in a certain way that the main soma actually gets a proper signal so that as a whole is actually can be known as the function known as summation there can be an easy explanation by sort of like definition because summation is like an additive effect of several impulses in neuromuscular junctions like uh, if there is an impulse coming from one exon to the dendrite another exon is actually giving this an other type of impulse or maybe weaker or maybe more stronger in the same dendrite but in the uh, two lateral sides then all those type of two impulses are going to be integrated in such a manner that they would actually uh, end up for doing a sub threshold or applied uh, same type of impulse to actually sum up and make a more stronger type of impulse like one plus one is equal to two so those two impulses are going to be summed up together to produce a more stronger impulse that the whole thing here is would be known as the process known as summation